I don't know why, but I just uh, I I've had a thought of just discussing betrayal today. Um, somehow I thought that would be a a good conversation, some a conversation worth having. So, who's been betrayed in your life? Raise your hand. Okay, who's betrayed somebody else? All right, so why don't we start with a definition. What's, it, what's betrayal mean? You guys just answered you've been betrayed and you betrayed others. So if you don't know what the word means, then you're all idiots because how could you possibly agree to both sides of something if you don't know what it means? Let's start with you, Danny. When someone trusts you, Okay. Betrayal as a violation of trust. Of course, if, if you want to define betrayal as the violation of trust, what's the next thing you have to do? Ishwar. Okay. Wrong answer. It means you're not paying attention. And we're only like 10 seconds into class. What's, what's the next thing we have to do? Ross. You got to find trust. You got to be careful when you're defining words that you don't just swap out one word for another. Um, so a trust, we, most people are familiar with the term trust in, in a legal sense. Um, and then we're also familiar with the word trust in a, in a, um, I don't know, colloquial sense or common parlance sense. We use the word trust all the time. But trusting somebody means that you have two parties. In a trusting relationship, you got two parties. You have the trustor and you have the trustee. So the trustor is the person who is trusting somebody entrusting somebody and entrusting somebody with something means they are empowering the other person and they are vulnerable to the other person and the other person acts on their behalf or sees to their best interest in some way and they cede control and they become vulnerable because that other person is empowered or tasked with taking care of that thing on their behalf. And then the trustee is the person who is then given that trust or given that vulnerability. So I become vulnerable to Ross. I tell Ross, hey, I'm going to have to go deal with somebody and I need you to have my six and watch my back. And I don't bother turning around and looking at what's behind me because Ross told me he was going to watch my back. So I don't look and watch my back anymore. So that's a trust. You become vulnerable in a trust. And now you could trust somebody to, I don't know, you could trust somebody to remember the house number. You're on the block, you're going to someone's house, you forgot the house number. You trust somebody to remember the house number. If they mess up, the stakes aren't that high. Because you could just call the person and figure it out or look for the car or whatever. It might be a relatively minor inconvenience. Or you trust someone to pick you what flavor of ice cream to get. And then they, they wind up getting something dumb like bubblegum flavored ice cream or licorice ice cream or some ice cream you're not into. Daiquiri ice cream. And, uh, and so then you're, you're bummed out. But the, you know, the consequences of not getting your favorite ice cream is, or one of your top three, it's not, it's not, that, it's not that significant. So there's no, 
this, it's important to, to quantify trusts, trusting relationships, things you're entrusting people with, how much control you're giving something, over how significant that thing is for you, how vital it is. And the more important the thing is to you, the more careful you are about who you're going to trust, isn't it? Low-level stuff, you might trust almost anybody. High-level stuff, there might be very, very few people. Sometimes you don't trust anybody. You just do it yourself. You decide, ah, it's, just, it's not worth the risk. I'm just going to do it myself. So to betray somebody is to violate a trust. That was your definition, right, Danny? Which then leads us to ask what a trust is. A trust is you become vulnerable, you seek control to somebody, either by force or voluntarily. That person becomes a trustee, you become the trustor, and you are dependent on that person, and it could be a big deal or a small deal or anything in between. You guys follow that? Okay. Let's say I never entrusted Madam with anything. Could I feel still betrayed by Madam? I didn't formally or even informally see control, make myself vulnerable to him. Could Madam, nonetheless, could I say he betrayed me? And somebody go, well, what did you, what did you entrust him with? Or what was he entrusted? Nothing in particular, but I still feel like he betrayed me. Would that be a reasonable statement to make in the English language? Yes. Yeah, I think so. And that's because betra betrayal can also be a violation of loyalty, which doesn't necessarily have a specific trust involved. By the way, these terms are complex enough and they are multifaceted enough in the English language that oftentimes theorists will have different ways of defining them. And so I'm representing a pretty standard model where the violation of trust ethics or loyalty is considered to be a betrayal. And the betrayal is gonna, in, it's gonna involve the violation of one of those three things. Did you guys follow this? So you started with trust, so we ran with that. Um, and then that leads us to thinking, are there other ways in which you might feel betrayed? If there are, then we need a larger definition than just betraying a trust and another standard one that's given is loyalty. Loyalty is defined as faithfulness um, to something or someone. And, um, and in some ways, I, I, I think, this is my personal feeling on the subject, I think that loyalty is an implicit trust, an unstated trust a general trust. It's not formalized, it's not stated, but it's a, it's a generic, undesignated sense in which you are vulnerable to that person where you are depending on them just to behave in certain normative ways in relationship to you because of the thickness of your relationship and therefore there is an assumed loyalty, devotion, faithfulness, responsibility, although it's not anything specific or anything, and therefore someone could betray you just by speaking ill of you or not showing up. There's, and you, there, there have been no formal arrangement or even informal arrangement. There's just a general sense in which in our relationship there's a certain degree of loyalty which is expected. If that loyalty isn't displayed, I feel betrayed, and I think what's happening is it's an unstated trust, an undefined trust, a generic trust that, based on your community, the, the mores of your community, the value system of your community, there are certain automatic expectations for people that you have a certain degree of depth with in a relationship, and if they don't 
live up to those. You may feel betrayed by them, although they didn't do anything in particular. Do you guys follow that one? So I define loyalty separately, and then I merge the two definitions together, and they became stated and unstated, or explicit and implicit, and I, I tried to see them both as being the same thing. Do you follow that? The other standard thing, which is considered to be a betrayal, is when somebody breaks moral principles. Could Katie um, not do anything to me? Zilch. Had nothing whatsoever to do with me. But he went and did something else in his life. Totally unrelated to me. And I feel betrayed by him. The answer again is yes. For instance, I mean, it could be a, he could move without telling me to some other state. I call him up and he could say, oh, I moved. And I, How could you move without telling me? Or he could drink alcohol or take drugs and I could feel disturbed because, wait a second, we're, you're sober, I'm sober. This is a foundation of our relationship. I feel betrayed by you. Or he became a Christian. I say, well, how could you betray me? Convert to Christianity. Why would you do such a thing? <laughs> and so, which obviously, you know, freedom of religion is a pretty big one. I think everybody believes people have freedom of religion. But nonetheless, if this is our thing that we're doing together, and then you bounce, all of a sudden, I may feel betrayed. Again, I think when somebody violates that moral principle, it's not only an unstated trust, it's a trust in their dealings with other people that has nothing necessarily to do with you. And so I think this violation of trust still holds for all three definitions, whether it's loyalty, whether it's morals, or whether it's an actual trust that's violated. I think provided you're willing to define trust in a multifaceted way, which I just attempted to do, I think betrayal as a violation of trust works. You either violate something explicit, you violate something implicit, that's part of our group dynamic or our, our, our plausibility structure within our group, things we just assume are understood, or you have a, a breach of character that has nothing nothing to do with me directly. But nonetheless, there is some implicit sense that your actions and my actions coalesce and we're doing something together and you stop doing that and you betray that ethic that we share and that ends up making me feel betrayed even though it had nothing whatsoever to do with me. Do you follow this? Now, if we were on Instagram, which of course we are, but if we were on Instagram and I was sophisticated and knew what I was doing, then I would say something really dumb and impoverished intellectually like, you know, just learn not to have any expectations of people. And then, you know, and then your feelings of betrayal will, will dissipate and they'll evaporate like the fog you know, in the morning sun. And then, and then we could end the class early and you guys could ponder the deep meaning of that and share it with your friends. And the thing is, I don't believe that. I think that as social mammals, we have to trust people because we're not lone wolves. Lone wolves aren't even lone wolves. Wolves are pack animals. Therefore, the whole idea of a lone wolf is ridiculous because they form packs. And so we are a social mammal and we require relationships of trust to survive and to thrive. And so learning how to trust people and trusting people is an essential facet of any halfway decent life. 
you're not even in the like the B's and the A's of life. You're just maybe in the D's or D pluses of life. You have to trust some people. You know, pre-COVID they did a um, a poll in the Western world. Over forty percent of people said they didn't have one deep relationship. And so I, I think you're, you're almost failing at life if you have nobody you can trust in your life. Let me say that again. I think you're almost failing. Maybe you get a D minus or a D, some, you know, but you're, you're low on the totem pole. And you're not doing well if you have no relationships where you can depend on people. I also don't think you have dozens of relationships where you can depend on people. I also don't think a blind uncle is better than no uncle. I think you should hold off on trusting people until they earn your trust. And I think if you can have three or five people in your life you, you can trust, that's an amazing life. I also think there's a continuum, how much you trust somebody, what you trust somebody with. But as social mammals, to survive, what to speak of, to thrive, we need to learn how to develop trusting relationships. We need to see control. We need to become vulnerable to people. We need to let people have our backs, watch the fire while we sleep. They get to sleep while we watch the fire. And that's how we get stuff done. Now, if you were betrayed when you were a child, so I'm going to pause before I do the tangent. Trusting successfully increases your survivability. It's also part of a thriving life. We all need to become experts at trusting people. And betrayal is a pretty serious problem because it decreases your survivability and your likelihood of thriving. Because if that person breaks your trust, oftentimes there's consequences. Negative consequences that have a deleterious, degenerative effect on your life. Therefore, I think that cultivating trust and being sensitive to betrayal is totally normal and natural. And anybody who says you should just be beyond being betrayed and have no expectation of anybody, they're just... It's very indulgent. It's very masturbatory. It has no actual profound, deep meaning that you're going to be able to use in your life. It looks good on a Cracker Jack box, but that's about it. So I reject the proposal, the presumption, the premise that the goal is to trust nobody and to have no expectations of anybody and therefore to not suffer betrayal. I rather think life is a game of trust and betrayal and ideally growth. You know, we have this idea that life is supposed to be fun, but I don't think that's on the man I don't think that's in the manual. I definitely don't think you would reach that conclusion if you looked at the nature of this world where you're born and you grow and then you dwindle and you die and you reproduce and things are torn away from you. If you look at the temporary nature of our uh, inhabiting a particular body and what, what, what happens to you while you inhabit a body, I don't think anybody could come up with a reasonable argument that the world was made for happiness. 
Uh, you can imagine if you went into a prison and you thought it was a house and you were like, why are there bars and all these doors and there's all these locks and you can't unlock them easily and I can't get around this place at all and the bathrooms have no privacy and there's so many people living in this house. I don't even, it doesn't make any sense. Is it, was this a single family house? Was this a multi? What's going on here? And you would be totally vexed because you had this assumption that the prison should be a single family house. And then with all the stuff that was there, the bars and the control towers and the gun turrets and the, and, you know, the cells and the bathroom blocks, and you, you, you get disturbed by that. You get disturbed by that. Huge walls, you can't go outside easily. It's really tough to find the entrance and exit. The door doesn't open when, when you want to leave. But then when somebody explained to you, oh, no, no, you're in a prison. You're a convict. You're in a prison. We don't, we've designed this place so you don't get to move around and do whatever you want. This was designed for your penitence. The penitentiary. It's designed to make you penitent. To make you thoughtful and remorseful. To regret your past misdeeds. It's supposed to edify you. Then all of a sudden you look and you're like, oh wow, you guys did a good job. You knew what you were doing. So if there's an assumption you're supposed to just be happy in this world, then things like betrayal and this and that, you need to get rid of them. Suffering you need to get rid of. But if, if you don't view the world like that, if you view the world as a place where you're supposed to undergo some penance, where you're supposed to get some of the just desserts, good and bad, from what you've done, but you've always got the opportunity of growing from the experience, and that's what your free will consists of. But you don't just get to manifest a bubble bath when you're in prison. It's because you want one, so you like pray for it real hard, and all of a sudden the guards drop off a, what do they call those things? A bath bomb for you. So as much as I see suffering as intrinsic to life and growth as being the real, that's where your freedom really soars, your ability to learn and grow, that's where you've got unlimited potential. Just being born into a body that will grow old and die, you've severely curtailed any kind of bodily happiness you're going to have. Just as you start to get the hang of things, then your body stops functioning as well as it used to. Just as you start to get the hang of it. Just as you get really expert at enjoying, your body starts malfunctioning and the batteries start to wear out and you start getting a lot less juice. You know, like when you... If you have children, you'll buy them electric cars at some point, little cars they can get into and they press the pedal and it goes. And then when the batteries on those things go, they don't just stop. They just start to, they go, but you don't necessarily switch the batteries out right away. You let it go for a while and, you don't, and it starts to go slower and not run as well. That's what old age is like. You, you set up the car, it still works, but it just doesn't go as fast as it used to go. Put your pedal to the metal and it just doesn't go as quick. Your reflexes just aren't as quick. Most of you don't know what I'm talking about because you're too young. But it switches up. Darshan was playing basketball and he just totally shredded his Achilles heel, his Achilles tendon. Was down for three months, surgery. 
Same thing happened to Dom on Monday. Was in Muay Thai class. Went for a switch kick. Blew out his Achilles tendon. They, they, they jump thinking their tendons were as good as they were when they were in their 20s. <laughs> but they're not. Because they're in their 30s, mid, late 30s. Their tendons aren't as good as they used to be. And so they try. Prabhupada said, when we, was at the, at the bottom of some stairs, he said, when I see the stairs, I still want to run up them, just like when I was a kid. But I can't, because I'm, I'm 80. But the desire, you just want to run up the stairs, it's still there. So, irrespective of your wealth, or your, your looks, or your strength level, or your intelligence, or whatever barometer, or whatever, you know, lightning rod you're using to determine what's success or what's, what's important in life. Just being in a body means any kind of serious, long-term, permanent happiness is out the window. That's why we talk about birth, death, old age, and disease. Because there are these problems with the world that you simply cannot get around. People are like, oh, you know, 40 is a new 30, or 50 is a new 40, or whatever they call it. Nobody's out there going, 90 is a new 20. Nobody's saying that. You might be able to stretch it a little bit with surgery, or hormone replacement, or this or that. But nobody's out there going, 90 is a new 20, man. Nobody's saying that. So, just being in the body means you're going to suffer. Where you got the freedom is what you make of it, how much you grow from it, how much you learn from it. That's where human beings have an almost unlimited capacity for growth, irrespective of the circumstances. And great evidence for that is Viktor Frankl, who lived through Auschwitz literally and became a better person for it. Learned lots of valuable lessons. So betrayal is, is part of the suffering people go through because you have to trust people and sometimes you mess, mess up, sometimes you make a mistake. Sometimes you trust the wrong person. And then you get betrayed. Somebody violates your trust, either through their life that has nothing to do with you, but it's something you thought you shared, or through some implicit thing that you assumed that they would understand or that in your community it was understood, and they betrayed that. Or you actually trusted them with something. Confidentiality or whatever it might be, and they betrayed that or some combination of the above. Do you guys follow this? So being bummed out when people betray you is totally natural because it decreases your survivability it makes you less able to navigate this world. We should all be sensitive to and dislike betrayal. It should bother all of us the same way if somebody starts burning you. <laughs> it bothers you and you avoid it because it's a problem for your survivability. The same way somebody covers your mouth so you can't breathe. You have a natural inclination to remove their hand and it creates distress for you because you're supposed to be able to breathe, you're not supposed to get burned, and you don't want to get betrayed. Because they all have a degenerative effect on your quality of life. Did you guys follow that? If, additionally, you were betrayed as a child in a relationship where you had to trust the person, who do you have to trust? As a child, 
your parents. Your parents are deities when you're a child. The idea that your father and mother are mortal beings, that they're going to die, that they make mistakes, that they're faulty, that everything's not your fault, that they're not perfect. That kind of abstract thinking. Eight, twelve, somewhere in there. Otherwise, you think your parents can protect you. Four-year-old, five-year-old runs to his mother for protection. They don't, they, don't, they don't do the math and be like, oh, that guy could probably beat up my mom, therefore she can't really protect me. They're not doing math like that. They just have an automatic, trusting relationship that's built in where they take, you take shelter of your parents. Attachment figures in general, and usually the primary of those are parental per parents. Um, if you got betrayed by them, then that makes you extra sensitive to betrayal later on in life because your survivability was decreased, it created problems for you, it was degenerative, it was deleterious, you suffered because of it, and so you're going to be scarred. And you're going to be less trusting and more sensitive to betrayal later on in life. More so than the normal extreme sensitivity that everybody automatically has to betrayal because it's a bad thing and we, we want to make successful trusting relationships, not let them fall apart on us and then leave us wounded and vulnerable. Do you guys follow this? So, I got a little bit of advice <laughs> for all of us, given that we've all been betrayed and we've all betrayed others. I've got a little bit of advice. Number one, first piece of advice. Don't betray anybody for the rest of your life. And there's a few reasons for that. One is there's karma, so if you betray people, then you're going to get betrayed. That's, that's there. But it's also just a crappy way to live. And when you betray, if you value loyalty <laughs> and you value trust, which obviously we do because we want to have those things with other people, and then you break that trust, you're actually going against your own value system and you don't have integrity and you can't feel good about yourself because you shouldn't feel good about yourself because you lack integrity because you don't live up to your values and ideals you're not even striving to. So a good first step, independent of the law of karma, is don't betray other people because you don't want to be betrayed, which means you value loyalty, you value trust, and if you don't live with those things in your own life, then how can you be whole? How do you have integrity? How are you a whole person? You're a hypocrite. You value honesty, but you're deceitful. You value loyalty, but you're disloyal. You value trust, but you're untrustworthy. And this, if you're not an idiot, and you don't dumb yourself down, You'll be tortured by your own lack of integrity, your own lack of wholeness, your own lack of ability to live up to your value system or even striving to live up to your value system. And internally, you'll live a tortured life independent of external circumstances. And you'll get, you'll get everything you do will come back to you anyway, and so you'll suffer twice. Do you guys follow that? And then number two is, when people betray you, do some quick math. Quick math. Quick math is, 
would I have done the same thing in the same circumstance? If you would have, oh, how do we feel when we're betrayed? What's the feeling we feel? We feel hurt, we feel sad. I don't believe that's the emotion. What'd you say? Yeah, I don't know if you feel rejected. I mean, it could be a, a secondary emotion. Yeah, who said that? Yeah, that's true, stupid. Actually, I'm sorry. We're gonna do a grab bag. You're all right. Nobody said any answer that was, was wrong. It wasn't the answer I wanted, but nobody said an answer which was wrong. So I'm gonna stop faulting everyone's answers. Let's just hit rewind for a second. Mea culpa, sorry about that. Who, who said the first one? Hurt, okay. Do you feel hurt when you're betrayed? Of course you do. You feel wounded and you feel sad, right? Okay, you feel sad. And then, mother, what did you say? Rejected. You feel rejected. Sure, you feel like they don't care about you, so they, they functionally rejected you because you assume that they chose to betray you and therefore they chose to reject you, and so betrayal involves rejection, right? Right, give me one second. We're going to get to you one second. Then you said you feel stupid. Stupid for having set yourself up to, to have been betrayed, right? Then you have a lack of confidence, a loss of confidence, rather, because you now feel gun-shy to trust again, right? You don't want to put yourself out there. You feel paralyzed, you're crippled. You can't jump back into a trusting relationship because you've been hurt, right? Excellent. And if you got hurt young, you might spend your whole life having difficulty jumping into trusting relationships or stepping into them even because you're always afraid that the same thing's going to happen again because if your parents did to you, so is everybody else. Uh, somebody said angry? Yeah. Angry, sure, you feel angry. And then somebody else said one more? Resentful. resentful. And resentful is anger at mistreatment. I wanted resentment. That's what I was looking for. I was looking for resentment. Resentment is anger at perceived mistreatment. It's anger at perceived mistreatment. And anger is always a transitory emotion. And anger always gives rise to grief and sadness and pain. And so within resentment, we find anger and then we find below both of them hurt and sadness. You follow? What was the one you said? Rejected. Rejected. All right, we'll get to rejection and loss of confidence and stupidity in a minute. Um, I think when you feel betrayed by somebody, I guess in an extreme circumstance where you have incredibly low self-esteem, you might not blame the person, just think, I am scum of the earth and I deserve everything I get and not feel any resentment. I think that's theoretically possible. I've met people like that where that's how they respond to betrayal. They just go to a really dark place where they feel like they have no value and they don't blame the person who betrayed them. I think that's unusual, though. I think most of the time we end up feeling resentment. And I think resentment's a great emotion. I think resentment is the appropriate response when somebody who you trusted betrays that trust. Either by falling away from the values of your community or betraying your own trust, either explicit, your own explicit or implicit trust, so whether it's loyalty or trust or ethics, I think a betrayal or a violation of any of those um, results in resentment. And then you move through it, like you move through all resentment. Resentment's another great emotion. Why is resentment a great emotion? Because you leave the door open for the relationship to be here. We got it now split resentment into two, that was the correct answer. We've got to split resentment into two. Resentment number one is, I have bitterness towards you that cannot be cured. 
That's a fundamental bitterness. It's never going to go away. That kind of resentment's poison. Got to let that one go. Then we have the other type of resentment, what we'll call resentment number two for today's discussion. And that resentment is, I value this relationship. I'm not walking away from the relationship just yet. But I am putting you on notice that you've violated our trust, our relationship, in a way which is significant and which may result in that relationship uh, becoming extinguished or being put on pause or being canceled altogether. And by resenting you, I send you a message. I make it really clear to you that you've done something wrong and you make amends. Therefore, it becomes transitory and the doors open for that person to step back into that relationship of trust, make appropriate amends because you trusted them and you don't want to let go of that trusting relationship at the drop of a hat because sometimes good people make a stupid mistake and it's not that just as soon as they mess up in any way, shape or form you kick them to the curb. That's also not a very good life where you invest in relationships. There's significant relationship. There's those relationships have, 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 have stood the test of time. They've been earned. You got a lot of miles with that person on the road of life. And then they make a hiccup or they trip or they make a mistake. You don't, why would you let go of something like that? You got a perfectly good um, um, buzzer for buzzing your head and face. And then maybe the blade gets a little dull or something like that. You sharpen the blade. You don't just throw the machine out and buy a new one. Why would you do that? You get a car, needs to, the tire goes flat. You don't just throw your car away. You put a little air in the tire. The flat tire thing is interesting because the car is dysfunctional. If you don't fix the flat tire, you cannot drive the car. I know there's one flat tires. Just work with me, guys. If, 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 you, if you don't fix the tire, you can't drive the car. And if you do try to drive the car, you have way bigger problems. Tire gets shredded, you run on your rim, you rip your rim, your axle, and then you can't drive at all. And you go from a $20 problem to a $20,000 problem real fast. It's a relatively small mistake, but it's a mistake that puts you dead in the tracks and it has to be repaired. It, amends have to be made. It has to be mended and fixed. By the way, the word betrayed comes from tray, which means to give and to trade, where you get the word trade from. And so when somebody goes against that, they betray you. They go against that natural reciprocal relationship. That's so the etymology of the term fits really nicely with how we understand the term in English. Um, So I like resentment, definition two, because the relationship is paused. Something has to be fixed. It might be as simple as fixing a flat tire. You don't want to throw out the car over that. At the same time, you can't drive it anymore because you've got to see if this is a harbinger of something much worse, if something much worse is going to happen. So you've got to press pause and you've got to look at what happened and give the person a little room. And maybe they don't get it, so you've got to let them know what they did to mess things up. This takes some guts. It takes some guts to not shrink away and turn away and just lose confidence and, and go back in your cave. It takes some guts to stay in it, to feel that resentment, to express it, and to fight for a relationship. Sometimes you bet on the wrong horse. 
Sometimes you trust somebody on a level and you made a mistake. You, they were not worthy of that level of trust. And then you got to look. I don't think stupidity is the way to look at it. But the thing that you need controls you. The deep need, I mean, you can go with really simple stuff like sex and money, drugs. Those are just, it's, that's real low hanging fruit. It's very easy to see how your need for money, your need for sex, your need for drugs, if you are in a, an addictive situation, um, then those things control you. And you. Yeah, you're, you're, you're controlled. We say, oh, he, he wasn't thinking with this head. He was thinking with... We have statements like that to make the point that you're controlled. Your decisions are being governed by some biological process. You're not thinking clearly. So whether you're addicted to sex, whether you're addicted to drugs, alcohol, whatever the case may be, uh, that need starts to control you. You lose your freedom. And, uh, um, and you become victimized. And people can exploit that. Sometimes it gets a little more subtle. It's not quite as easy to spot. What if you need companionship? What if you're lonely and you want companionship? Or you crave accolade or fame. Then people who flatter you, they'll be able to get you to trust them prematurely in ways that they don't deserve because they mirror you and fulfill the need that you have and you see yourself in them and you trust them more than you should because you feel like you've met somebody who shares your values. Do you guys follow this? So somebody realizes you have mommy issues or daddy issues and then they play that card with you. Then you're going to just fall right into that because it's a, like a deep hole in your heart that you've been spending your whole life trying to fill and somebody comes along and they're going to fulfill it for you and then naturally you're going to end up trusting them way too quickly. So it's not so much that you're stupid. It's that those things that you need, Jung says, if you don't understand it, it controls you. So when you haven't diagnosed what your needs or wants are, and you don't know what motivates you behind the scenes, then those things end up percolating out and you wind up trusting the wrong people who don't deserve your trust and you, you're, you're the connie. They might be the conner. They're conning you, but you're the connie. You buy into it. And so there is a, a stupidity, but there's a vulnerability that's created by these unacknowledged needs you have that you haven't processed and worked through, and so they overwhelm you. Are you guys following this? Did that make sense, Bailey, or did I lose you? You're always looking for a friend, someone you can count on. So you meet somebody and they're like, yeah, I'm all about friendship. Just that, you're like, okay, this, I met somebody who's got my same, my same thing. But they were just being that because that's what they saw you wanted. Whether it was done consciously or whether it was done unconsciously, they just mirrored you and gave you what, what, you, what they thought you wanted. You thought it was real. You thought they were where you were at, but they weren't where you were at. They were where they were at, and it comes out in due course of time. You following this? 
It's not always an addiction or a vice, but it's always some unfulfilled need you have that leaves you vulnerable to making fast friends and jumping in quicker than you should and not vetting people properly. A little different than stupidity. And then, instead of getting gun shy, if you can be brave enough to feel resentment and articulate to the person how they hurt you and what they should do to make amends, that's, that's powerful stuff. And, you know, I, rejection is also just like betrayal. It's just part of life. <laughs> Usually it has nothing to do with you. They're running on their own script, fulfilling their own needs, and, it's, and their actions are kind of like the planets moving. It has nothing to do with you. It just seems like it. It seems like the planets are coming towards you, but they're not. They're just doing their thing. Um, but even if somebody does choose to reject you, that's also part of life, right alongside betrayal. The only time that gets really dicey is if you have no sense of self and what you needed more than anything else was to be accepted. Then when you get rejected, you're left gutted. If you have a healthy sense of self, which is your responsibility to cultivate, then when somebody rejects you, it won't break you because you'll know that you deserve acceptance. You deserve love. You deserve a relationship. And when you have a healthy sense of self, then when you get betrayed, and you feel resentment, and you make sure you're not being hypocritical because you, you wouldn't have done the same thing they did in a similar circumstance, and you articulate for them what they did wrong and how they can make amends, you give them a little time, a little space to do that, and they don't, then what do you do? You let that person go. You downgrade them. You stop trusting them. You come up with a more realistic assessment of the level they should be at in relationship to you and you reflect on why you put them up here when they deserve to be down here. Why fools rush in where angels fear to tread. What it was. What, how you made that miscalculation. What that want or need or unacknowledged part of yourself, that kind of deep thing you were searching for that, le that led you to go into that position in the first place. And then... You grow from the experience. And you become a way less likely to be a betrayed person in the future. Because suffering is basic to life. Making mistakes, zigging when you should have zagged, betting on the wrong horse, going left when you should have gone right. That's going to happen to everybody. The mark of a successful life is how you recover how resilient you are and how you're able to grow from those experiences because that's where we have an unlimited potential. And so through the process of being betrayed, placing your trust, having that trust violated, and then recovering that through the transitory emotion of resentment, which then leads to growth, either by the restoration of that relationship, which is also a very, very valuable thing to be able to do, to reconcile, to trust again, to let someone recover, to let somebody grow from the experience. That's a mark of a very healthy person as well, the ability to leave that door open. And the ability to also let that person go, and do what they need to do, recognize your own mistake how you put too much trust too quick with that person where you were culpable. You learn your lesson and you go through a few, a few iterations of this in your life and all of a sudden you've become a black belt in trust, a black belt in looking at people's character, a black belt in knowing your own issues so they are no longer unacknowledged and controlling you subtextually beneath the surface subconsciously but they're right out in front of you you can see those tendencies and you can navigate through them and you're on a way to having a deeply rewarding life with those three or five or five or ten close people you can trust and, and having an, an amazing life 
a really successful life, not free of any betrayal, not free of suffering, not free of old age, disease, and death, not free of reversal, but an amazing life filled with tremendous growth and huge lessons and big wisdom and things just get better and better and you become better and better at picking who to trust, surrounding yourself with the right people, being the kind of person that's, that's worthy of that circle of friends. All right. I think I, think I said my piece. Thank you, IGTV. Give me some feedback, guys.